Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Surgery Live. Thanks for being here. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rob Simon to introduce Dr. Joyce and our topic for today. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, Dr. Joyce uh, did his residency at Cleveland Clinic. He then went on to Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York to complete his surgical oncology fellowship training. Um, and we are happy to welcome him back as the newest member of the HPB team. Um, and today he's going to be talking about gastric cancer. So please feel free to chime in and ask questions and um, uh, take it away, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the inter introduction, Rob. So I'd like to talk a little bit about gastric cancer today. And in many ways, um, it's a little potpourri of topics. I think topics that are frequently ignored. I think as a surgical community, we have beaten the lymph node dissection and some technical issues to death. Um, and I think there's actually some more important things and topics that we encounter more frequently. So I'll give a very brief overview of the care path for resectable gastric cancer, but that's widely available in the guidelines. I wanna talk a little bit about what surgeons should know about the molecular classification of gastric cancer. I think in the case of gastric cancer in 2020, you know, we're treating it like we treated breast cancer in the 1970s. No one would even dream in 2020 of treating a breast cancer without knowing its hormone receptor profile, its HER2 status. And as of today, in our national guidelines, uh, we do not um, recommend any subclassification of gastric cancer. We treat it all the same. And I'll show you a little bit of data to show that we're probably not doing the right thing in certain cases. And we're using very broad brush strokes to treat what is a very um, heterogeneous disease. Then I think something that we all encounter um, is how do we palliate patients with advanced gastric cancer? Certainly in my practice, the majority of patients that turn up to my clinic uh, typically have stage four disease. And um, I think as surgeons, we can also help those patients and we can help um, drive the discussion of how they should be managed. There are many tools in the toolkit for managing things such as bleeding and obstruction. And I don't think any one size fits all. And I think looking after those patients is just as important as knowing the technical details of a D2 lymphadenectomy. So actually in the United States, gastric cancer is an orphan disease. It's, it's decreasing in incidence and particularly the intestinal type, those distal gastric cancers that one would have seen in the past mainly due to improved sanitation, the diagnosis and treatment of Helicobacter pylori. Um, proximal gastric cancers are actually on the increase, and depending on your institution, you may, may see more or less of those. If you've got a strong thoracic surgery group, you may not see much of them at all, and a lot of those patients um, fall into different treatment paradigms based on people's training uh, pathway. But I think there's some, um, I think, you know, the, there's, it's important to have involvement of surgeons that are both comfortable in the chest and in the abdomen. Across the world, you know, gastric cancer is the third le leading cause of, of death, you know, in the Far East, but in the United States, it's number 15. So even at high volume centers in the United States, uh, we just don't see very much of, of gastric cancer anymore. So I think that's why, you know, some of these topics get a little bit ignored. And I think above, uh, you know, it's important that these cancers are treated um, in centers with a reasonable level of volume, which again, in the United States may not be that much. It could be 15 or 20 resectable cases a year. There are some genetic uh, considerations to the CDH1 mutation, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. We tend to see a fair amount of that here at, at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and just one of the, for any residents that are on the line, and that's, you'll, you know, when you take a history of those patients, Often you'll find that there's a history of labular breast cancer in the family, and that's something if, if you're, when you're seeing a patient with gastric cancer, was there breast cancer in the family? And if it was, was there lobular? And you need to start thinking um, genetic reasons in your head. Patients with Lynch syndrome um, certainly develop gastric cancer. We have a lot of patients under surveillance here in the Y Center uh, for the uh, uh, hereditary colorectal neoplasm. So again, we see a fair amount of those and then in f familial adenomatous polyposis, you know, typically as foregut surgeons, we're focused in on the duodenum. 
Uh, but certainly in, in the past 10 years or so, um, our GI colleagues here uh, at Cleveland Clinic have described a striking increase in the incidence of gastric cancer uh, in these FAP patients. And whether it's that we're finding them, they're living longer and developing it, or the phenotype is changing, I don't know. Uh, but certainly one needs to keep an eye on the stomach uh, in these patients. And in particular, they tend to get this carpeting of fundic gland polyps, and it may take EUS to uncover those cancers. A lot of those cancers, when they present, have been at very late stages, despite that they, they've been undergoing endoscopic surveillance of their duodenum. So you have to think about gastric cancer in that population as well. So very briefly, you know, how, how do we manage a patient with resectable gastric cancer? So obviously, like any cancer patient, they have to be staged. Particularly in the early cancers, endoscopic ultrasound is key. Um, and T1A cancers can be treated uh, with endoscopic resection. They do not need a gastrectomy. Um, and if you find deeper disease or high risk features, those patients can go on to uh, receive surgery. Uh, but obviously, you need an endoscopist um, with, with, with the skill set to do that. T1B cancers need formal resection. And then when you reach the population of T2 or patients with positive nodes, um, essentially those patients should receive perioperative chemotherapy. I'll discuss later on about some caveats to that. Um, T2 disease, you know, when we our staging is not perfect. So if you have a patient with a T2 N0 clinical stage, you know, 25, 30% of those will have, you know, higher stage disease. So that's why we book or lump those patients into the perioperative uh, chemotherapy protocols. If at all possible in a patient whom you're going to do uh, perioperative chemotherapy, you really should consider a diagnostic laparoscopy, uh, particularly for the thicker tumors, the T3 to T4s. Even if they don't have obvious peritoneal mets, you know, 10% of those T3, T4 tumors will have positive peritoneal cytology. And their outcome is, is equivalent to gross peritoneal disease. I don't even want to begin to discuss uh, the role of cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC and gastric cancer, because really there is no role outside of a you know, well-defined clinical trial. Uh, but I think it's important to stage these patients um, appropriately. And um, certainly chemotherapy can so-called clear the peritoneum when you have positive peritoneal cytology. Whether that actually has a difference on their overall outcome is unknown. So I think you need to be laparoscoping these patients up front. Um, you know, there's, it's always hard to fit them into the schedule, uh, but I think it's a worthwhile endeavor uh, before you put a patient on a potentially curative pathway. One thing that I notice a lot is, is when patients come to my clinic with, with um, gastric cancer is they come with a staging PET scan. I honestly use PET relatively rarely in gastric cancer. In those diffuse lesions, those lesions with signet ring cells, mucinous tumors, the PETs are frequently, frequently negative. I'll show you a picture on the next slide of a patient that clearly has linitis plastica and the PET is completely quiet. So I think it can be useful if you have a directed question based on a high quality contrast enhanced CAT scan. But to me, a PET scan for gastric cancer is limited. I think a good quality cross-sectional contrast enhanced CT scan is much better. If you have questions based on the, anat on the anatomy of a particular node on a CT scan, I think that's a useful um, use of PET scan. But to me, an isolated PET scan does not adequately stage a patient with gastric cancer. And I do see that coming through the clinics. Um, and in, you know, the, the standard of care, I would say in this country and for many years before this for local regionally advanced gastric cancer is the perioperative chemotherapy approach. Um, historically, in the United States, we did use adjuvant radiation, but a relatively limited role for that in the era of uh, D2 uh, nodal dissection. But certainly there is evidence for it in the adjuvant setting um, if you are, operate on a patient up front. So this is an example, you know, just of a PET scan where you can see this really impressive thickening of the stomach. And in fact, when we got a cross-sec, you know, a proper CT, this patient had peritoneal carcinomatosis and the PET scan is completely quiet. Um, and some oncologists are in tune with that, but often when you, when they, when these patients come through tumor board, you know, you get this false sense of reassurance 
uh, if someone has just read the PET scan report. So I think the multidisciplinary evaluation and deciding on the clinical staging is absolutely key. Um, you know, as surgeons, sometimes we're a little bit slow to get patients on the schedule. And I think the oncologists give up on us and sometimes just start patients on systemic therapy, maybe even without a surgical referral. So I think we've got to make ourselves available. We've got to be involved in that initial um, allocation of the uh, clinical stage. So just a few words on ESD for superficial gastric cancer. Historically, you know, this was really described in Japan and Korea where they actually have screening programs for uh, gastric cancer due to their risk profile. And they for many years have shown good results for endoscopic therapy of early gastric cancers. Uh, but now there's been a large cohort published um, out of the United States, and this included patients uh, from Cleveland Clinic led by Dr. Bot. Uh, and this is very safe for T1A gastric cancers. If you wanna be absolutely restrictive with your criteria, they should be T1A tumors less than two centimeters, non-ulcerated, no lymphovascular invasion, and really well-differentiated tumors. There are, of course, expanded uh, criteria for this. Again, I think you have to take the condition of the patient into account. If you have a patient maybe with an ulcerated tumor that's young, long life expectancy, I would take that patient to the operating room. But if you have an 87 year old patient in a nursing home, you know, I would expand your endoscopic options. Um, the R0 rate, 75% or even higher, depending on how you choose these patients. There's a very low complication rate, about a 6% intraprocedural perforation rate. Vast majority of those can be managed endoscopically. I think the way we manage these patients here, these patients see everyone up front. They see the surgeon, the oncologist, the gastroenterologist. So it's a team discussion so that we can deal with positive margins afterwards so that we can make a good assessment of whether they've got nodal involvement and that we can adequately clinically stage these patients. So again, one of the key points being, we've got to get that clinical stage as, as, uh, as, as accurate as we can uh, upfront. So just very briefly, since I mentioned uh, peritoneal cytology and diagnostic laparoscopy, um, I just wanted to briefly uh, touch on that point. So the standard of care for patients with peritoneal metastasis, that's M1 disease, whether it's gross disease or just positive cytology, the standard of care is chemotherapy with palliative intent, of course, using an operation or other techniques to palliate the patient if necessary. Um, the outcome for positive cytology without peritoneal disease is really equivalent to gross peritoneal disease. So for standard of care, I would not treat it any different. Uh, when it has been studied, you know, neoadjuvant systemic chemo can convert positive peritoneal cytology to negative cytology. Prognostic indications are really unknown. So, you know, what do you do with that patient? So, if they're elderly, poor performance status, I mean, I think best supportive care is see what therapy they will tolerate. Uh, but, you know, if you have a young patient that converts, that has tolerated treatment well, that has demonstrated a response, um, I don't think it's out of the question to pursue a resection. I would only do that after maximizing their preoperative chemotherapy. So, you know, the FLOT data, what, what I'll talk about in a moment, you know, that you talk about four cycles pre-op, four post-op, we try and push that patient to get more systemic therapy on board. Those patients really need to prove their um, biology. Cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, that's a whole talk in itself. Um, I don't know, to tell you the truth. There's um, some trials going on in the Netherlands and France looking at it in gastric cancer was one trial out of China that looked at it that was positive, but really it's, it's in very, very, very selected circumstances, particularly for something like a total gastrectomy, it's a lot to add to cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. But you will occasionally find those patients that have had a good response, that have made it through a lot of um, systemic treatment and, you know, an operation could be an endpoint to systemic therapy, so it's not out of the question but a little bit beyond of what we talk about today. So in terms of for years, you know, we've used the Loren classification to classify gastric cancer. And then um, on the right hand side of that little table, there's the World Health Organization classification, which, you know, puts you right to sleep. 
I've never found these particularly useful. I think they've been of academic interest. Uh, they don't particularly change how you manage the patient. Perhaps in the, in the diffuse type, you might take a wider margin or something, but really inconsequential to me as a surgeon. So let's move to the next slide. So I know it's early in the morning and I'm not gonna go on too much about you know, molecular classification, but I think this, this is the TCGA GA, um, molecular classification of gastric cancer. I think this with potentially some tweaks will be the game changer in how we approach and treat gastric cancer. To me, this is the equivalent of hormone receptor status in breast cancer. So this was looking at, I think, almost 300 um, flash frozen specimens of gastric cancer, and they'd done extensive uh, genomic workup. And they classified um, gastric cancer into four distinct types. Uh, chromosomal instability, they typically have intestinal histology, a lot of them focused at the G junction. An EBV phenotype, about 9% of gastric cancer. In particular, these tumors have a lot of immune cell signaling. They've got a lot of a lymphocytic infiltrate. They almost look like a lymphoma under the microscope. And I think going forward, we'll start using immunotherapy much more in these tumors. Very, very, very warm from an immunological standpoint. Then genomically stable, that's the diffuse histology, those patients that have CDH1 mutations. Most importantly is the MSI high standpoint, and that's the group that I'm gonna focus on today. So these patients like colon cancer, you can just do basic immunohistochemistry. And in this group, about 22% of patients were MSI high. In other groups, it's probably closer to 10 to 15%, but this is a real group of patients. And to me as a surgeon, I want to know whether these patients are MSI high when I see them in my office before deciding on a treatment pathway. The majority of patients with uh, MSI high gastric cancer are um, just sporadic mutations. They tend to be, uh, you'll see it'll be a MLH1 that won't be expressed, and it's usually due to hypermethylation. I'll come back to the MSI high patients. So for our local regionally advanced patients, um, the standard of care is perioperative chemotherapy. The ECF regimen was the mainstay for many years based out of the Medical Research Council trial out of the United Kingdom or the MAGIC trial. FLOT is now the gold standard, uh, but it's not for everyone as I will show you. Um, and in a lot of the patients that we see, the older patients with poor performance status, I think FALFOX is a very good option for those patients. So this paper is um, uh, from 2006, and this was the MAGIC trial, which showed that perioperative chemotherapy had an overall survival benefit for tumors T2 and above. This included G-junction tumors and distal gastric cancers uh, as well. And for many years, this was our standard of care. Subsequently, epirubicin was really shown to be absolutely useless and didn't add anything um, to the uh, situation, but certainly an overall survival benefit, 36 versus 23%, but obviously it's still very poor outcome. We're still, um, you know, losing a lot of patients uh, with relatively early disease. In more recent uh, times, um, we've started using FLAT. It was a trial uh, led from um, Germany. Um, this uh, compared ECF uh, versus FLAT. Um, it was a 15% complete pathological response, so certainly a more active regimen. This regimen is not for everyone. A quarter of patients are hospitalized for toxicity. Half of the patients develop grade three and grade four neutropenia, 20% with infections. And in this group of patients, you know, less than 50% complete their planned chemotherapy. Most patients get through the preoperative treatment but a lot do not uh, get their treatment afterwards. So I think going forward, we're all, you know, a little bit like we do in pancreatic cancer or in the rectal cancer world, you know, the real question is, is can we push more systemic therapy up front? Obviously you don't wanna push it to the point that the patient is no longer a candidate for an operation, but most of these patients do not get um, treatment after surgery. Flat data, there was no, no data on MSI uh, high status, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment, which I think is worth pointing out. 
So if you've got a patient with a good performance status, I think flat is for sure the way to go, uh, but it really is not for everyone. The 80-year-old with gastric cancer that you think will tolerate some chemotherapy, I think Folfox is a very reasonable regimen uh, in that type of a patient. So let's talk a little bit about the role of chemotherapy in mismatch repair deficient gastric cancer. So this uh, study was out of uh, Asia where they do a lot more upfront operations and they studied the use of adjuvant KPOX in resected stage two and stage three gastric cancer. And certainly in the group as a whole, it's beneficial. So KPOX is a, is a good option if you operate on a patient up front and they've got positive nodes. Uh, but it, when they broke it down by MSI high status, no benefit for patients with microsatellite instability. So out of that group of patients, there's just, it didn't work, the chemotherapy period. Then what about the, our, the patients that we see where, where in, in, in the Western world, we tend to do a lot more perioperative chemotherapy. So data relatively li, uh, limited. This is from the MAGIC trial where they use the ECF regimen. They had a 20 patients with MSI high status. There was no significant pathologic response uh, to chemotherapy in any MSI high patient. Um, and in fact, when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves here, you can see the chemotherapy may actually have been detrimental in this group. And there's been a lot more looked at this in the colon cancer literature, uh, but 5-FU may not be the right thing for these patients. Uh, also, cisplatin um, is probably not effective in the, in the uh, MMR deficient group. Limitations of this data is that really ECF has been superseded by FLOC. We don't have any data based on the, those patients' MSI high status. Oxaliplatin, based on the um, colon cancer literature, may have some activity in these patients, and taxanes don't uh, have the same limitations um, in terms of microsatellite instability. So whether we can apply this to the FLOT data, it's questionable, but I think this really raises questions about the use of chemotherapy in these patients. Next slide. So this is a, a meta-analysis that um, used the MAGIC data, the classic data, and again, um, pretty compelling you know, evidence to show that uh, chemotherapy didn't add anything to these MSI high patients. So how do we put this into practice? This is, in full disclosure, this is not on the guidelines, um, but I routinely order MSI um, status on, on endoscopic biopsies. I think if you have a patient with clinical stage T2N0 disease, that patient definitely gets an operation up front if they're MSI high. I, I think that's very reasonable. It's not on the guidelines, but I, I really don't think that there's any reason to give them chemotherapy that number one is not effective and number two could be harmful. For more advanced disease, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to consider FLOT. Um, but again, it's, you know, these patients overall um, in, you know, when you look at them, do better with surgery alone. So if you have a patient with poor performance status, uh, maybe that's more on the symptomatic side of things. With MSI high disease, there's nothing wrong with doing an operation up front. And I think we'll find more data to support that. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in clinical trials, but you really have to question whether the trials that we have for perioperative chemotherapy apply to these patients uh, when you really delve down into it. So I think, you know, you have to have a good tumor board discussion. So just in terms of palliating gastric cancer, we see a lot of patients with bleeding. Um, certainly that can be an argument for an upfront operation. Radiation is fantastic at bleeding. Even a single eight gray dose often gets you fantastic hemostasis. hemostasis. The response is durable, about three quarters still of hemostasis at six months. And I don't think you have, if you want to get a patient some preoperative treatment, if um, they're bleeding, um, you know, a single dose of radiation uh, may allow you to get them to preoperative chemotherapy if it's indicated, taking the biomarkers into account. So just don't forget about radiation in terms of bleeding control. You do not have to race to the operating room. I don't worry about operating, um, you know, a long time after radiation. I think we worried more about it in the past, but both with, you know, esophagus and rectal cancer might make the operation a little bit more difficult, but it certainly doesn't preclude an operation many, many weeks to months after radiation. 
Gastric outlet obstruction, last but not least, um, we see a lot of these patients. I think you have to consider their life expectancy. It's longer than pancreatic cancer. Um, if they've got, if you can get some targeted therapy to HER2 or if they're MSI high, think about how long they'll live. A stent may not be durable enough for you. Do they have synchronous bleeding or anemia? That might push you to a palliative resection, uh, which certainly has some morbidity. Think yeah, about yeah. the extent of disease yeah, yeah. as well. So just in terms of surgical bypass versus stenting, a uh, question that we as surgeons come across, stents work well, they work quick, but they don't work for long. So we all you know, struggle with doing these GJs and I think they take a long time to work, but I think it's worth having the discussion with the patient if you think they've got a reasonable length of life to live, I think there's still a role for surgical bypass. And finally, palliative gastrectomy. There may be some survival benefit in selected patients. You know, if you have a patient that's bleeding and obstructed, and you think you can do the operation with a reasonable uh, level of morbidity, I think it's, it's a reasonable option. I think you have to think about it. When you do a palliative gastrectomy, you do not need to do an, you know, do an extensive lymph node dissection. So the key takeaways, I think you've got to accurately stage these patients clinically. It's a heterogeneous disease. We're really mooching around in the dark right now with gastric cancer. So I think we need to be attuned to the molecular profile, and I think that will come more and more into play. A minority of patients are cured, so we have to consider palliation. We have a role in that, and radiation is fantastic for bleeding. It really gets you out of trouble. So I'll wrap it up there. Great talk, Dan. So, just to kind of, uh, if anybody has any questions, please enter them in the chat or, or uh, speak up. But, um, you know, Dan, can you just talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, surgery and 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 um, if you place feeding tubes in these patients routinely? Because um, a lot of them, you know, even after uh, uh, subtotal gastrectomies or especially total gastrectomies, may take them a little while to. Um, you know, tolerate adequate PO intake. So certainly, there, certainly in our group, there's nothing that incites more hatred and love in equal measures um, than feeding jejunostomies. Um, after a total gastrectomy and, you know, a very, very low threshold for a feeding jejunostomy tube, I think how you place them, the tubes that you use, all of those, um, you know, tubes have complications, but I certainly have had a good experience with feeding jejunostomy tubes. But I think you have to be careful how you use them. You know, if you have a, you know, distal gastrectomy, um, I think is different, uh, whether they have gastric outlet obstruction to begin with. Uh, but I, you know, I think you have to be careful with feeding tubes. If you think it's just a shorter level of time, I think a nasoenteric feeding tube can be useful. But if you have an old patient that you do a total gastrectomy on, I think, I think a feeding tube really gets you out of trouble. A lot of the time you can get them home, get them on tube feeds, there's no rush with eating, and you can really take your time. So I have a pretty low threshold for a feeding J-tube. Great. And then um, uh, a question was posed in the chat about um, commenting on the treatment options for patients with Lynch after total gastrectomy with a positive proximal margin. A positive... <laughs> so I think, you know, first of all, when you if you have a positive proximal margin, um, you know, I think hopefully you would have done a frozen section in the operating room. Usually I'll do one frozen if it's positive, then I'll take the rest of what I can. And then, you know, after that, I think you write it off to bad biology. I certainly think, you you know, in those patients, I would think about, you know, adjuvant chemo radiation. Of course, that's, you know, 5-FU based chemo radiation, not a lot of data. Um, radiation is tough after a total gastrectomy. You know, the intergroup 0116 trial that came out of the United States, that, you know, that that really we don't use in the same doses because it's pretty toxic. Um, but I think, you know, I would radiate that patient, uh, but you're probably looking at bad biology in that situation to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, and then... I wanted, to, I wanted to ask a quick question. If yeah, that's go okay. for it. Yeah, yeah. So in the, I guess, two questions. One, in the uh, rectal cancer world, you're right, we operate after uh, radiation all the time, but we divert those patients with a loop ileostomy. Do you have any concerns about uh, your anastomotic or any anastomotic concerns, one, after operating radiation? My second question is, 
we've all had, in terms of your staging, we've also moved away from endorectal ultrasound, which is about how we used to locally stage these and we now do MRIs. Is there any reason or utility to think about that? Does anyone look about that in gastric cancer? For us, it avoids the, you know, it's not uh, technician dependent. MRIs are pretty readily available and it lets us see the mesorectal envelope and lymph nodes. Didn't know if any of those would be relatable, relatable uh, concerns in the gastric cancer. Not so much MR. I think the, the thing with gastric cancer is we don't have anything quite as good as an MRI scan. So I think it's about using the modalities of contrast enhanced CAT scan, EUS, and PET scan where indicated all together to make a good clinical decision based on all of that. But even with that, we understage people, we overstage people all the time. The radiation question, I think it depends where you're talking about. I mean, if it's a single shot, eight gray, you know, for a distal cancer, I don't really worry about that. For the GE junction stuff, I mean, you know, I didn't go into so much into GE junction, but for GE junction tumors, you know, um, based on the cross trial, you know, people have been doing preoperative chemo radiation all the time. Some retrospective data to show that it may have an impact on your anastomosis, but in the esophageal world, you usually get away with it, to be quite honest with you. Um, certainly if, you know, depending, you know, if, if you're from, it's more so for esophageal gastrectomy, you might try and minimize the amount of radiation to the gastric conduit. If you maybe have a sievert type three with a lot of fundal involvement, you might push that patient to perioperative chemotherapy to get away from the radiation. But honestly, they usually do just fine. I would also argue that, you know, in those patients, extremely low threshold to placing a feeding tube post um, uh, intraoperatively. And then, you know, you know, treating, even if they do leak, treating them with, with um, stents or, um, uh, intraluminal plastic uh, stents through the hole um, actually seals them up pretty nicely. Um, another comment about genetic testing. Um, is there any role in genetic testing in family members of patients with uh, gastric cancer? I mean, I think, you know, depending on the age group, so young patients, patients with a family history of lobular breast cancer, I think those patients should have a genetic referral. But, you know, an 85 year old with a distal gastric cancer, I don't think it's, you know, it's not like pancreatic cancer where we have data per se to drive clinical decision making in the metastatic setting for chemotherapy. But definitely in younger patients, those patients should certainly. Uh, have consideration for testing for sure, particularly the diffuse type histology where you might be um, concerned for CDH1 mutations. Dr. Augustin, I see that you uh, you asked a question um, about a 45 year old patient with distal gastric cancer, limited peritoneal disease um, from a previous diagnostic laparoscopy, upper abdominal anterior the stomach, and excellent response to FLOC. Um, would you proceed with definitive surgery or not? So that's an interesting scenario. So I think, first of all, if that patient's had a response to FLOT, give them more, finish out their treatment. Then, so the question is, is that, so there's a few things, you know, the MD Anderson group have shown data about actually trying to clear the peritoneum with laparoscopic hypec and cytoreduction. reduction. And then if you clear the peritoneum with up to five rounds of lap um, uh, cyanide reduction and hypic, then doing a definitive gastrectomy, you're really trying to, you know, aggressively um, treat by or to help them define their biology. But um, and, and that may be an overkill. But the other thing, if that patient will say finished all eight cycles of FLOT and has good performance status, the patient is up for an operation. I don't think it's wrong to operate on that patient without HIPEC either. The, the HIPEC thing may just not be helpful, but if that patient has proven their biology, it's not wrong. I mean, we, we do whipples for pancreatic cancer. So, you know, and, and we all have patients that you get a CTP study and they have liver metastasis. So while it's pushing the envelope a little bit, it's not completely crazy. You know, I think in some of these patients, an operation can be an endpoint to chemo. I think in these patients, you know, it's often a discussion with the oncologist. If I do an operation, render them NED, you know, can we give them some time off chemo? It's a little bit about quality of life. You know, stringing someone out on systemic therapy until they have unacceptable toxicity is not a, a great, you know, quality of life either. I mean, the, the issue is we don't know. It's slightly crazy, but it's not wrong. 
Yeah, I, I, I sort of second that. I think uh, some of these decisions are based off of, you know, what you're getting to start with. A 45-year-old who clears the peritoneal disease on a subsequent diagnostic lab and completes the entire flaw treatment. I mean, I personally feel that the data would not basically have that kind of a patient in any of the trials. And if you look at the 15% complete pathological response for the flawed group, I, I don't know why one, one shouldn't try. I mean, we opted for far less indications. And the other thing in those patients, there's nothing wrong with dragging your feet. So, you know, if, if that patient completes all their flaws, you know, I wouldn't race them to the operating room in a month. Even give it six, even eight weeks. Let them prove their biology. If they have, you know, if they have recurred after eight weeks or so, again, you clearly are not going to help them. So, I, you know, we have, there's a huge emphasis on time to treat and things like that. But also time can be very helpful. So, you know, dragging your feet a little bit, I think in these cases can be helpful as well. Because if, if you have, you know, regrowth of disease within eight weeks off treatment, clearly an operation is not going to help. But if they've proven themselves, I think then that's that's the time to go in and do an operation. Thank you. Well, um, I know it's a little past 7.15. Um, so I guess we should probably wrap this up, but uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, comments and questions. And thank you, Dan, for uh, a great talk. All right, have a good one. Thanks very much, guys. Fantastic talk. Just as a reminder, Surgery Live meets the second, third, and fourth Fridays. And in, in 2021, we're gonna add actually the fifth Friday as well. We rotate through all the uh, general surgery subspecialties, such as bariatric, breast, colorectal, surgical endoscopy, foregut, hernia, HPB and pediatrics. We're next scheduled to be back here next Friday. Um, Dr. Stephanie Valente will be moderating a topic on uh, breast angiosarcoma. So look forward to seeing y'all then and thanks again for joining us on Surgery Live.